Hello and behind me is a retired Qantas Boeing 747-200 here at the Qantas Founders Museum in Longreach in Outback Queensland. And in this video, I'm gonna show you through this aircraft um, in quite a lot of detail. We're gonna have a look at the flight deck, we're gonna crawl down inside and then finish off by having a look and seeing what color the uh, black box is right at the back of the plane. So join me and let's uh, check out the uh, Boeing Queen of the Skies together. This is a Boeing 707-138 and in 1968 this was one of the largest airliners in the world. That was until the world got their first glimpse of this brand new double deck and twin aisle behemoth, the Boeing 747. Qantas never actually purchased the first 100 series, waiting instead for the 200 which you can see in front of you. The differences include more powerful engines, maximum takeoff weight and range. Most, including this one, also came with a longer upper deck with 10 windows, although it wasn't until the Dash 300 series arrived that the upper deck grew even longer and got its own emergency escape slide. Let's start with the exterior of this aircraft. Passenger transport was meant to go supersonic with the likes of Concorde and Boeing's own 2707 project. It was expected that the 747 would be sold primarily as a freighter, so by having the flight deck upstairs, the whole nose would actually open up, allowing easy access to freight. If you look closely to where I'm pointing, you can actually see the line where the nose panel would open up, uh, similar to a C5 Galaxy or Antonov 124. These two prongs you see here are pitot tubes and measure airspeed. And there's another two on the other side, just in case one is faulty. Behind that is the angle of attack monitor, which would alert the crew to an imminent aerodynamic stall. Just behind the forward landing gear, you've got this electronic equipment hatch, which is the access point for the crew if there's no stairs or aero bridge. This circular thing is the underside TCAS, which stands for Traffic Collision Avoidance System. It's a mandatory for larger aircraft and monitors the airspace for other aircraft. If one is detected, it sends directions to both aircraft of how to avoid an impact. As you can probably read, this hatch is the lavatory service where the sewerage is expelled. Contrary to popular opinion, it's not expelled in flight. This little red antenna lets air traffic control know where the aircraft is. This other red antenna is attached to the DME, which stands for the Distance Measurement Equipment. This is an older navigation device that sends radar pulses to a specific location, such as the destination airport, giving an accurate distance whilst in flight. These days, it's only used as a backup. Here's another access hatch and the second DME antenna, which you can set to a diversion airport, for example. If anything is poured down the sink, it's expelled through the red drain mast. The reason that it says it's hot is because you have to remember that at 40,000 feet, the temperature is minus 50 degrees Celsius, so unless the liquid is hot, it'll freeze up before it's even expelled. Now the reason why it sticks out so far is that drinks like coffee, wine and Coca-Cola would leave a really unattractive skid mark underneath and that wouldn't be a good look. The interior is pressurized by air from the engines, which is obviously incredibly hot, so it has to be cooled down. These two air vents, and there's one on the other side as well, take in cold air which then cools the hot pressurized air via three heat exchangers in here. The cold air then escapes down through these louvers which open up depending on how much air is needed to cool the pressurized air. And just in case something goes wrong and the pressure builds up too much, there are these two emergency pop-out valves that will release the pressure inside. This red beacon is to warn the ground crew that the engine is running or is about to be turned on as they would be literally sucked into it if they got close enough. And this other striped larger antenna is not the water drain that you just saw, but is instead a VHF antenna. This is what the crew would be using to speak to air traffic control down below. What's unique about this aircraft is that it's the only surviving 747-200 with Rolls-Royce RB211 engines. These are high bypass turbofans and what I didn't realize until I saw them in the metal is how much air actually bypasses the hot core and I'll explain this with an engine they had inside the museum. So the air enters through the front where it's compressed, fuel is then added, there's an ignition and then it explodes out the back creating thrust. But as you can see as I sneak the camera into the back of the engine, the majority of the air bypasses the hot core that's to the right of my camera and is simply blown along by the large fan at the front. This is one of the reasons why newer jet engines are a lot wider as a higher percentage of the air now bypasses the core, in fact the majority does. 
For comparison's sake, here's the 707's Pratt & Whitney JT3D turbofan, uh, and you can see that the amount of air bypassing the hot core is a lot less. You've probably noticed now that there are three engines attached to the left wing. Well, sort of. This one is actually an injured pod for the JT9D engine, uh, that could be transported in the case of an engine failure at some distant airport. Particularly when jet engines were less reliable, if an engine did become unserviceable, the airline could simply fly out another engine uh, on the next flight. An alternative would be to charter a large transport aircraft, which would cost considerably more. The 747 size is really highlighted by these massive wings, but what you can see now is them in their smallest and sleekest form. Extending out from the wing's trailing edge are the three-part slotted flaps, which you can see now in this in-flight footage. These work by increasing the wing's surface area and improve lift by up to 90%. Again, it's difficult to appreciate in the video footage how large these flimsy looking things are, but they really are an engineering work of art and create pretty cool looking condensation if you're landing or taking off in the rain. On the front, or the leading edge of the wing, are Kruger flaps, which also increase lift, but their uniqueness is that they actually fold up from underneath the wing, enabling the wing itself to remain fairly thin, uh, because obviously thicker wings are less aerodynamic. Now, these pods you see behind the wing are not fuel tanks as some people suspect, but rather aerodynamic covers for the flap extension mechanisms. They themselves are just metal linkages uh, that wouldn't be very aerodynamic, hence the smooth pod that covers them up. The actual wing fuel tanks are further inside the wings and you can't see them from the outside. Most aircraft, including pretty large aircraft like the 777, only have two main landing gears, as does the 707 on display here. In contrast, the 747's main landing gear is far more complex, with 16 wheels spread over four separate landing gears, which all work to spread the weight over a larger area. Having said that, it can still land if only two opposing landing gears are deployed, uh, as everything was over-engineered just to be as safe as possible. Let's check out this wingtip in a little more detail. These are high frequency radio antennas sticking backwards from the wing's trailing edge and you'll find one on the other wing as well. With the 707 they were located at the top of the vertical stabilizer as you can see here and interestingly with the updated 747-400 they were again moved back there although they were internalized so you can't see them. These antennas are used for more long distance communication than the VHF uh, and they are increasingly being replaced by satellite communication. And back at the wingtip, you'll notice at the front corner is the white flashing strobe light, and the bulb on the lateral edge is the green navigation light, and it's red on the other wing. These multiple little tentacles sticking out are static discharges. Flying through things like water or ice or dust creates static electricity, and these discharge points allow for gradual release rather than a large and sudden releases that would otherwise disturb onboard equipment. This vent underneath the wing is a knacker duct. This, and there's one on the other side as well, allows air to escape when the fuel tanks are being filled, and then during a flight, it allows air in to replace the fuel that has been burned. And finally, this circular port is where fuel is released from if they have to lower their landing weight. Now just before we head inside, let's have a quick look at the back of the aircraft. These two air vents here are the outflow valves for cabin air, and there's also the auxiliary power unit back here, although my footage of that isn't great. This is a separate engine that creates power simply to run the aircraft's many systems. These horizontal stabilizers are really massive, and what's interesting is that in the newer 747 400 model, they've actually inserted fuel tanks inside them, which enables the aircraft to fly even further. Now let's head inside this beauty and check out a few spots you've probably never seen before. We'll go upstairs and check out the flight deck shortly, but first, let's climb down into the main equipment center via the forward business class cabin. The 
This is the brainstem of the 747 where the automated action all takes place. There's flight management computers, autopilot, pressurization, communication controls, anti-icing, etc. all down here. Now down here in the center, we have the inertial navigation systems. Well, there's three in fact, which work together to improve reliability. They tell the aircraft where they are in the world using accelerometers, gyroscopes, and other sensors, including the DME that you saw earlier. Remember, this was before GPS. The crews would enter the latitude and longitude of where they were, and then where they wanted to go, and then this would work out how to get there. Let's continue on and have a look at the forward cargo hold. See this orange tube on the wall? That's the cabin air pressure lines and the circular things are the pressure relief valves that you saw earlier from the outside. And on the opposite side are these green oxygen cylinders. The two larger ones are for the crew and then there's eight lined up for the passengers. You may recall cylinder number four exploding on QF30, which was a 747 flying over the Philippines. Cabin pressure was lost, they descended quickly to 10,000 feet so they could breathe normally again and diverted to Manila without injury. Let's head back upstairs, but quickly, just on the other side of the ladder is this red handle, which lowers the forward landing gear manually if there is a hydraulics failure. Here we are standing in the nose of the aircraft and what's unique to the 747 is that the first row is actually sitting forward of the flight deck. In fact, the pilots are sitting above row three and looking up, you can see the cables that physically connect between their controls and continue inside the roof all the way back to the wing and tail. It's incredible to think that these little cables, albeit with a lot of redundancy built in, control every movement this massive aircraft makes. Now let's head up this famous spiral staircase. Initially this area upstairs was used as a lounge where first class passengers would get sloshed at Qantas's expense and then provide entertainment for the crew as they attempted to descend the stairs for a nap. Later on the bean counters overruled this and introduced more seats. In later Dash 400 and Dash 8 models this upper deck grew considerably and they got their own escape slide. Let's head forward and check out the flight deck. The captain sits on the left, first officer on the right, and behind them is the flight engineer, a role which was completely removed and computerized with the 747-400 model that arrived in 1988. Now this is something special, being able to move the four throttles forward in a real Boeing 747. Unfortunately, you may have seen earlier that engine number three was in reverse thrust, so it was a bit clunky, although I still did manage to imagine views like this when I was spooling up. What's quite profound here is how analog everything is and in stark contrast to the Dash 400 model that you see now which I filmed without image stabilization at Haas in Wollongong a few years ago. Now back in the Dash 200 you'll notice that there's a single electronic screen which is TCAS which is the traffic collision avoidance system you may recall from underneath the aircraft. It's also shared with the VSI vertical speed indicator which tells you the rate of climb and descent. Coming up is my guide Tom explaining some of these gauges. Very basic. Um, in fact, you come out of a constant speed aeroplane like the Cessna 210 that came in before. Yeah. He, this is called manifold pressure, engine pressure ratio, TACO, N1, which is the speed of the big fan at the front as a percentage. As well as temperature, here's a cylinder head temperature, fuel flow. Yeah. But if you're coming up one of those aeroplanes, this sort of thing, that's nothing different. Yeah. The engine over here has five more gauges for each engine. Yeah. So you've your N2, N3 gauges, you've got oil pressure, quantity and temperature. Yeah. All in there. Along the bottom, it's fuel transfers. Yeah. Behind the red flap, fuel dump switches. Okay. You can't do them by mistake. Yeah. Hydraulics, air conditioning, pressurization in the middle, electricals at the top, and this part down here controls the APU, the auxiliary power unit. So during the flight, the flight engineer would move fuel between the tanks to maintain a center of gravity adjust the thrust levers so that the engines were producing the same amount of power and otherwise just monitor everything. With the Dash 400 model they were completely replaced by computers leaving only two active participants in the flight deck. 
Now let's head back downstairs and move towards the back of the aircraft. So these are the business class seats and have a look at the old style movie projector. Now I'm not sure how they selected the movie, but whatever it was, you had to watch it. We'll continue on into economy class and my journey through the aircraft's pressurization system continues. You'll notice there are a few windows missing as inside the wall there in the distance, you've got these pipes bringing up pressurized air up into this contraption above you. It's eventually released into the cabin and is expelled out the back by these two vents you saw earlier. The air is not recycled and there's a complete changeover of all of the air every two and a half minutes. As we continue down the aisle, you have to remember that prior to this, every airliner such as the 707 and Douglas DC-8 only had a single aisle. They could elongate them, but that just didn't create enough room, so widening them was the next step and the 747 was the first wide body airliner as they became known as. And here we are at the back of the aircraft. I mentioned earlier about the colour of the black box, and well, here it is. It's actually two boxes, and they're both bright orange. On the right is the flight data recorder, and then on the left is the cockpit flight recorder. These other actual black coloured boxes uh, and electronic equipment are involved with the rudder and auxiliary power unit. And leaving the plane via door 5 right, you get this iconic view of the 747's tail and the flying kangaroo. Well, there you are. I hope you enjoyed that tour through this retired Qantas Boeing 747-200 that's on display here at the Qantas Founders Museum along Reach. If you're an av geek, this is something that you definitely need to add to your bucket list. As well as this aircraft, there's many other fantastic ones here. Just make sure you book a tour well in advance because they sell out very quickly and for good reason. If you like these types of videos, please check out my channel because I have many more. I walked through the first 747, uh, Concorde and around SR-71 Blackbirds and many other aircraft in other aviation museums. Uh, around the world. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. Thanks for watching.